this is 10 years after the 150th birth anniversary of Freud. And during the 150th year, and later on for a two or three years, there was a plethora of books, articles, spe special numbers on Freud. Unfortunately, I must frankly admit, I found them quite flat. Because in the name of paying homage, they had tried to domesticate Freud and make him a part of our lives because they were feeling that a person born 150 years could not do so on his own. He is not there to speak for himself. This is not my aim. Because I do notice that there is a crucial difference between the sciences and the, and the world of social knowledge, social scientists, sciences or humanities. Though the social scientists try very hard to imitate the scientists, physics is the queen of disciplines in the contemporary world. Nevertheless, the fact remains that there are crucial differences between the sciences and social sciences. Sciences are ahistorical. Social sciences are not. In social sciences, the history of knowledge, the history of knowledge systems, or the past of knowledge systems, if you like to liberate it from the clutches of history itself, is an important part. In sciences, they are not. This is, there are a lot of university students in this room. If you do not believe me, go to your department of physics and ask who Ptolemy was. I can guarantee you a majority of them will not know that. No, no answer. One or two might say casually that he was the father of physics, ancient physicist. If you tell them to spell his name, you will find nobody answering it correctly. There is a P in front of T. <laughs> so Ptolemy is difficult to spell. This is because science goes through a process where the past is scanned and consumed and integrated, if you can say so, or superseded, and then you forget it. Then you forget it. Unless you belong to one of the Asian or African countries <laughs> perpetually trying to redeem your self-respect by referring to some ancient scholar and, you know, who did wonderful things. There is nothing in between them and the present times. The recent heartthrob of Indians is Chanakya. <laughs> But not because they really are interested in Chanakya, they are actually interested in Machiavelli. Because <laughs> he has a theory of real politics, hard politics. And Chanakya is an Indian Machiavelli. So it is secondary, uh, secondary status of Chanakya, which they are interested in. At one time, they used to call Tagore an Indian Shelley. So, so this is the world in which we live. In social knowledge, persons do not die. They might become irrelevant for a while. They might go into near oblivion. They might be marginalized, but they come back. Freud, for instance, 
has undergone a serious process of marginalization in medical sciences his presence has <coughs> diminished dramatically there are still psychiatrists who are freudians too but they are not that many you might even say that outside united states and west europe they are and probably your whole of europe they are even less important but he has also made a triumphant entry into literary theory meta psychology cultural studies now into studies of cinema and popular culture because that's the way it goes on in social knowledge because new interpretations of the person emerge new uses are found for him and what you do with him partly depends on you you decide how to use him there is no powerful convention of how you must use him there may be dominant trends but you may do not may not have to like to be a part of the dominant trend so plato also lives in, in fact freud is called sometimes a crypto plato uh, platonic thinker i iris madoc once said it now plato is 2000 years old when you say he is a there is something platonic about freud's work you have a certain certain kind of concept of what that means and that's the way the ancients lived not the original ancients as a fixed known entity who can be read only in one way but that's the way the great thinkers survive in social knowledge the world which we are living and i now move to that part of the story is dominated by the enlightenment values the enlightenment values are something like 250 to 300 years old and this enlightenment enlightenment world or you can call it the enlightenment tinged world which defines the dominant values in global public culture there are four individuals who are seen as iconic figures and can be used in various ways incidentally two of them are also scientists but they are used differently in social knowledge darwin marx freud and who else einstein now einstein even in social sciences is not the same as is in within science darwin's use is not the same as it in biology or ethology for that matter it's a different kind of use in fact of this four in many ways darwin proved to be the most dangerous one because he gave us the theory of evolution but darwin's work vitiated the work of the other three einstein's concept of relativity was kept only for science other kind of relativity came much later in a truncated form in a different way all differences and all relativism was seen in terms of the darwinian evolution but it was called social evolution if you read some of the great um, novelists and thinkers and writers of india talking about harvard spencer who was 
uh, uh, fountainhead of that kind of Darwinism, social Darwinism, you might call it, as, as people have called it. So, uh, to some extent, Marx falls in the same category because he was an admirer of Darwin. He dedicated his major work to Darwin. He also saw societies in terms of historical evolution. Perhaps that is the reason by Freud has remained in some ways usable in other ways. Because though he was tinged by that social evolutionism, his theory and his meta theory was more open for us to work with him differently. And that's how he survives. Marcuse's use of repression in two senses. I might here say that if you compare Freud with Carl Jung, you will find that Carl Jung knew much more on the, of, about Indian civilization. He had read Indian classics. He visited India twice. He established two departments of psychology in India, helped establish them, one in Calcutta, applied psychology, and one in Benares. He was well versed with Indian classics and its subtleties as far as the psychological part of the story goes. But Indian showed very little interest in him. They were interested in Freud. The reason for that, I am now convinced, is that the Indians at that time were more confident than they are now, <laughs> than we are. At that time, they were not looking for testimonials from Western, great Western thinkers. They were looking for tools of criticizing their own society, tools for criticizing what they were seeing around them, tools for attacking what they considered crucial forms of unreason or irrationality, crucial forms of superstition, crucial form of absurdities which exist in this society. And Bedlam has other such examples. I don't want to go into that. I, I, otherwise, I will be wasting too much of time on that. So, but here, perhaps because some of Freud's concepts are in some sense uh, uh, not incompatible or not terribly shocking if you are aware of the text on Tantra. Hmm? both in Eastern Indian Tantra and Mahayana Tantra. No. So many scholars were aware of these things. It was not that then they were come. It was very strange to them. Finally, I will also point out to you, I once did a work on Girinda Shagar Bose, and I found he was the founder of psychoanalysis in India. And I found that in case of Grindashekar, his Bengali writings and English writings are very different in style. In the Bengali writings, he is much more himself. And sometimes, even when he doesn't use Freudian concepts, they come back indirectly and more powerfully in Grindashekar's work. And this was perhaps because Gindan Sekar was very aware whom he was writing for when he wrote in English. He was one of the editors of the International Psychoanalytic. He was aware. 
so he had this double ledgers and his exchanges with freud only scraps are av available because he was also psychoanalyzed by freud indirectly but all, the whole entire exchange was lost when the ship i which they were sending it to england to be published got torpedoed during world war 2 and all traces of the that manuscript vanished but there are conversations between freud and exchanges of letters between freud and gilles de chakrabos where freud is saying that that uh, uh, we are very proud that you are here with amartas and we also find that your writings are uh, uh, philosophically very sensitive to the demands of psychoanalysis i doubt sometimes he says i sometimes have doubts whether our infant discipline care can take that much of load of philosophy but one thing happened whether as a result of his encounter with green the sir or his or or his uh, uh how should i admiration for him all he is more imaginative and daring works there is a lovely story which i once used for something about grinder shekar bosses daughter going to meet him in vienna and she was a very ordinary bengali woman educated well read but in total awe of freud as it happened she was deadly scared of dogs and when she went to freud's place he found she found that freud had dogs and was very fond of them so freud admitted that he was exceedingly fond of dogs but also tell told her that do you are afraid of dogs your father is a psychoanalyst he should have explained to you you should have interpreted it why you were afraid of dogs <laughs> so she didn't apply she was shy and diffident but let writes in her book in her you know when she wrote a memoir you know a book on the journey to europe she said i didn't have the courage to tell him that one could also interpret your so such acute love for dogs <laughs> <laughs> i think that's hmm, if the empire talks back the empire of enlightenment that is to us speaks to us dog speaks down to us there are very ordinary people in very ordinary way can also have their own speak back to them it that of possibility is also there in this society and this civilization i do not want to take much of your time i only want to add as a last word so to speak that in social knowledge the icons of social knowledge are not those who write a book and closes it in a way that you can only write pg dissertations on them <laughs> icons of social knowledge epistemic knowledge are only those who allow you to define the know that knowledge itself not other knowledges of others but the knowledge itself it is my conviction that the vital clue to human creativity lies not in genetic equipment not the accident of a genius being born somewhere 
it lies ultimately in the capacity to host the otherness of others. I can summarize the three decades of work on human creativity. At one time, it was a very popular area. I also worked for about 20 years. I was interested in creativity studies. And there were a lot of studies, empirical studies. Like, for example, uh, if you compare the Nobel laureates with the comparable uh, scholars in the same universities, famous universities of the West, but uh, who did not get the Nobel Prize, you will find that the Nobel laureates always has, in the in, in gender index, they scored more high on femininity, may, if they were men, and on masculinity if they were women. Another finding was this, that if you If you give them complex drawings and simpler the graphics, the no, uh, re creative, uh, creative persons will choose the more complex graphics, always. Three, the highly creative will always can live with unresolved issues longer than unresolved problems of the discipline longer. And this cuts across science and social sciences, unresolved in their problems longer than those who are less creative because they want to close it, have a quick answer. But my reading, if I have to summarize in one word, I would summarize in this way, which is actually a Japatista slogan, Savantan Marcos, they, they use this slogan, that you must have the capacity to host the otherness of others not the sameness of others, hmm? sameness of others. Uh, so, so that you have the capacity to celebrate that other, the otherness of the other and that, this is another way of saying, I think I can put it another way, that you must have the capacity to host your anti-self within yourself. Only when you do that, then there is an inner dialogue that opens which triggers the creative effort. And I can give you many instances of that. I do not want to do this, that uh, the, I have spoken enough. Uh, um, but I could have given you examples. Uh, I have given my writings, plenty of them are soon there. Uh, uh, somebody like Kipling's, you know, uh, who hated Indians. Who he, he loved India's nature, you know. He was third generation, uh, uh, came from an English family, he was three generations in India. But uh, he hated the in, in, in Indians, but life, loved the flora and the fauna of India. His first language was Hindustani. Huh? But his greatest novel, Kim, breaks the taboo, because by that time his son had died in First World War. And even arch imperialist that he was, he couldn't take that. Somewhere in his unconsciousness, doubts have come about the imperial mission. So, the hero of the novel, who is Irish child, brought up as an India, a vagabond in India, Kim, and his friend, the Lama, who is stands for everything against that, stands against everything Kipling stood for. They are the heroes of the novel. And it, you know, in some sense, the most imperial vendor of the imperial, you know, of the imperial imagery, colonial imagery, ends up by writing a book which when we consider the first post-colonial novel. Same man. I can give similar examples from Tagore. I mean, in Tagore's Gora, if you read, you will find that Gora is a prototypical, paradigmatic novel of Indian situation, where Gora's love for India, his nationalism, delight often with, I mean, he didn't, uh, uh, think of nationalism in, um, you know, he doesn't talk the language of 
आदित्यनाथ एंड कंपनी ही साक्षी जी महाराज ही ही इज आर्गुमेंट्स एट दैट ऑफ विवेकानंद एंड जिवेदिता नॉट लाइट वेट टेक ओवर गिव द बेस्ट आर्गुमेंट्स टू हिंदू नेशनलिज्म एंड देन एंटिसिपेट्स ए पर कैरेक्टर गोरा द हीरो द सेम हीरो अंडर गोज ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन एंड बिकम्स गिव्स आर्गुमेंट्स फ्रॉम ए पर्सन हु डिड नॉट नॉट इवन नोन नॉट एंटर्ड इंडिया देन मोहनदास करमचंद गांधी इन he anticipates emergence of somebody like gandhi not only in that novel but a number of places there somebody like that will emerge to reaffirm civilization values and so that exchange within that interact that dialogue within self precipitated by confrontation with otherness and otherness where you are willing to set you willing to celebrate that is the clue to creativity all the rest is superfluous and secondary thank you very much for your patience